Good morning. Um, it's glorious this morning, wasn't it? It was glorious to be in his presence. Um, let's uh, read a few verses, please. Uh, starting in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Is that, is that better? Yeah, that's better. How's that? Is that, is that better? Is this better? Right there? Okay, you know I'm a soft speaker. Okay. All right. Acts chapter 11, starting with verse 19. Now those who were scattered, this is after uh, uh, Stephen was uh, martyred. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them uh, were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they came to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas, to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that, and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, Saul being who will later become Paul, he brought him to Antioch. So it was there for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And then I'd like to go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. <coughs> First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. Paul says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 1. And Jesus, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth, and he taught them. And then verse 14. Again, he's speaking to his disciples. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning that we sense heaven open to us because of your son, Jesus. And we rejoice because you have opened heaven to us and you've allowed us into your presence and you've come down to be with us. And we bless you and we praise your name. We tell you how thankful we are to be in your presence this morning, how glorious it is to know that you love us and care for us and gave us a savior in your son, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we we worship you this morning. And now as we come to this time of sharing the word, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, 
that you would tell us what's on your heart. And Lord, and in doing that, Lord, you would make it real to us. It would be as you're speaking right to us. That these would just not be words, but it would be you speaking to us. And you can only do that by your spirit, Lord. I'm a poor vessel, but your spirit is glorious. And he enables. And Lord, I ask for that enablement today for myself to speak these things that you put on my heart. I ask the same for those that, uh, those that listen, Lord, that they wouldn't be put off by me, but Lord, they would be captured by you, by your speaking. Lord, it's for your speaking that we ask. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this morning, um, you know, we've been talking about God's eternal purpose and all these things, and, and, and we've been talking really about the Lord's table the last week. And, you know, why, why has the Lord given us this table? You know, he, he, why has he saved us? What does he get out of this? And really, that's what I want to speak about today. You know, the Lord didn't just deliver those, uh, those Israelites from Egypt just to deliver them. Just to say, okay, I freed you. But he had a purpose in mind. That they would be a nation unto him. They would be his own peculiar people. What does Peter say in First uh, Peter that you were a holy race? A holy race. You know, a nation. A kingdom. And uh, so, my thought this morning is, why has God brought us to himself. What, what, what is now that he's made us his people? What is he looking for in us as his people? And I believe that what he's looking for in his people, both as individuals and uh, as a community of believers, today, he's looking for it today. And it's not, he's not just looking for it in the last days. He's looking at it for today. He's always been looking for this. This is the passion of his heart. This is the desire of his heart. And he wants a testimony of his son. That's what he wants out of his people. And uh, he wants this testimony to go out to the world, to fallen man. He wants it to go out to be seen by heavenly beings, heavens look down and wonder at the sons of God. And he even wants it to be to his own people. And I would say even today, especially to his own people. Now, what is a testimony? Um, you guys ever been to court before? Or you've ever been on a jury? Or if you watched the, I hope you haven't been to court because you've done something wrong, but if you have, you have. That's, that's past, that's under the blood. But remember when they, they bring you up there, you're going to testify. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Um, that's what a testimony is. It's telling the truth. And if we look really at uh, John, the first John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. That life which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Now that's a testimony. That's really what a testimony is. It's saying the things that are real, that I have found to be real, I am declaring to you. 
I'm declaring, I'm not arguing about anything, I'm declaring that these things are so. This is the truth, this is what I've seen. This is what I've experienced. And not only that, it's not just um, testifying of something you've witnessed, you know, seeing with your own eyes. Uh, not something, but it's also of someone you know. You testify of someone you know, and what you know about them to be true because of a relationship that you have with that person. And this is a testimony. A testimony is a declaration. I'm de declaring what is true. But it's also a manifestation. It's a manifestation of what is true. When the Lord Jesus was on the earth, he testified of God. Not by his teaching, but by manifesting a life. And it's this life that the Apostle John said, I've touched, I've looked at, I've held, and I know it to be the eternal life. Now, in Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, Jesus said to the disciples before he ascended into heaven, you shall be my witnesses. And that's an important thing, because the witness is left to us. It's not that we drum something up, but he's saying, you shall be my witnesses. We are to be the ones who declare and who manifest to the world and to fallen men, to the heavenlies, and to one another, the life of Jesus. We testify of Jesus. We don't testify of a doctrine or anything. We testify of Jesus Christ. We are to testify to manifest, to declare Jesus Christ. In Revelation uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, John the Apostle says again, I was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was in prison for his testimony, and his testimony was of Jesus Christ, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Our declaration... Then, when we talk about the testimony, our declaration is that the gospel is true. And what is the gospel? The gospel is this. It tells us, it shows us that Jesus Christ saves. That he is God's savior. And that he was sent to save us from our sins. The manifestation is that we are the light of the world, that all creation on earth and in the sea and in the heavens can see Jesus Christ manifested in us as individuals and as a group of believers. This is to be our testimony. Testify the truth of the gospel to the world, to beings in the heavenlies. We testify of the life of Christ, because he's made us light. Now, let's take one at a time. We declare that the gospel is true. Now, you know something? The youngest believer does this. It's not a, a hard thing to do. Matter of fact, when we first get saved, it's almost, it almost effervesces out of us to say that Jesus saved me. It's almost natural to us. We testify. We, we don't make a, a three-point argument showing that, you know, this is so. Uh, we don't uh, debate somebody. We declare, Jesus saved me. That's our declaration. There's nothing to be argued. We know it in our own hearts. And we declare it to others. You know, I think what happens to a lot of our young people is they think they have to debate. No, we declare. We declare what Christ has done. We proclaim it, that this is so. And I know it because it's happened to me. Because I know that Christ has come in and he saved me. 
He saved me. And there's nothing, there's nothing more than that to it. It's a simple thing to declare that. You know, I remember um, when my dad, you know, we declare it. You know, we de when we declare things, when we first get saved, we, we're talking to everybody. Uh, you know, now I don't know about people, you know, who grow up in, 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 in the church. I think that's a, a thing. But you know there's a big difference when they, you know they really see, start seeing the Lord. And they start declaring things. And they start saying things that, I've never seen this before. I've been here all my life. But for us who didn't know, we can't hold ourselves back. We talk to our friends. We talk to our neighbors. We talk to the people at school. We talk to the people at work. They can't shut us up. Because there's new life in us. And... Uh, it's not, like I said, it's not, we're not arguing. And a lot of times they're asking you, what is different about you? What's gone on? Why have you changed? What's happened? And we, it just opens up. And we just say, well, this is what happened. I met Jesus. And he saved me. And he's died for me. You know, I remember when my dad, because I was raised Catholic, I remember my dad, my dad, I, I think he was disappointed when my brothers and I became Christians. And uh, I think he, 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 it took the aggressiveness out of us. I think that's what he thought. Um, but I remember one time he was saying to me, what, what's wrong with the way I brought you up? What's wrong with the God I, I had? You know? And I remember just saying to him, Dad, you tell me what your God's done for you. And I'll tell you what my God's done for me. And my dad could only talk about tradition and stuff, and he didn't really tell me anything that God had done for him. But then I just told my dad, I said, Dad, God's forgiven all my sins. And you know, my dad walked away. I know it touched him because my dad walked away going, are you telling me? And, and he walked away. He wouldn't talk to me anyway from that. He said, are you telling me my sins can be forgiven? But that's all it is. It's a proclamation, a simple proclamation. I mean, even Paul, even Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what does he say? I, I, I give to you what was given to me, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. Simple. It's a simple testimony. It's a simple declaration. It's not an argument. It's a declaration. Christ died for me. This I know. I know this. This I proclaim. Now, it's not just that we declare this, but we do. And brothers and sisters, we also declare it in the assembly, not just the sinners. Not just the, you know, I hate to say that. We're all sinners. Not just to the unsaved world. But we proclaim it in the church. You know, that's what we were doing today. When we came to the table, you know what you guys were doing? You were proclaiming the gospel. And you know, again, I think a lot of young people and a lot of you, a lot of us that are older, who are just so afraid of opening our mouths because we're going to say something wrong, because it's not high enough. You know, there was a sister at our Tuesday night Bible study when I first got saved. And uh, she was a simple sister. She was a little older than me. But, you know, um, as far as, you know, you think like, we, we, we look at, some, sometimes we, go, we, we look at thinking that we know higher truth. Well, she wasn't one who knew higher truth. But she, would, she came to the meetings anyway, and she enjoyed the Lord. But, you know, she, could, she goes, there's something, and she would say, Sometimes she goes, you're just way over my head. But she would come to a meeting every once in a while, especially on a Sunday meeting, and she would call this hymn, because this hymn was her declaration. And it was 282, and, and, uh, and, and I, I guess you can show it, you know, but 282, this was her hymn. She didn't call it all the time, but every once in a while, did I get it right, 282? Yeah, it's 282. 
It's a great little hymn. And it's for those of us that think we just don't have the top notch. And it goes this, whoever wrote this was, I am not skilled to understand what God hath willed, what God hath planned. I only know at his right hand stands one who is my savior. <clears throat> you know, you look at the whole thing, it says, you know, I take him at his word indeed, Christ died for sinners, this I read, and in my heart I find the need of him to be my savior. And was there then no other way for God to take? I cannot say. I only bless him day by day who saved me through my savior. <laughs> that he should leave his place on high and come for sinful man to die, you count it strange? So once did I, before I knew my savior. And oh, that he fulfilled in me, and oh, that he fulfilled may see the travail of his soul in me, and with his work contented be, as I with my dear Savior. Yes, living, dying, let me bring my strength, my solace from this spring, that he who lives to be my king, once died to be my Savior. Now, you know something, brothers and sisters? That's saving knowledge. That right there is saving. That's all you need to know to be saved. You don't need to know anything else. The Lord can lead you into all those other things, but to save you, this is all you need. And every time she would call that hymn, it kind of humbled us that thought we were so smart and we knew so much and we had so much light. Because when she called that hymn, there was just a, a fragrance of Christ. Just so simple. Because the Lord was saying, you complicate so, so many things by your great knowledge. It's simple. I died for you. You know? So we declare it, and we declare it in the assembly. And so nobody, nobody in here should be afraid to be simple when you give thanks to God. That's it. That's all you're doing. You're giving thanks. You're declaring what he's done for you. And it's edifying to everybody. It's edifying. It builds us up. And you know something else what it does? You think that, you know, I don't have very much. But when you bring that little portion, someone who has maybe more, who knows a little more, lifts that little portion and makes something out of it with a prayer or a scripture. And then someone else picks up on that and it goes a little further. And then you have a fuller expression of the Lord just because you opened up so simply. That's what it's all about. That's the testimony to God. That's the testimony that he's looking for in us. <clears throat> Simply declare. <clears throat> now, we also testify or declare with our lives. We can't leave this part out of it because, you know, we tend to be those who just like to speak. We are to confess it. We are to testify with our mouths. You know, how else can we, you know, we, we share with others. But we also declare with our very lives these things. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, it's not to, you know, we think, oh, man, now he's going to hammer us. You know, now he's going to do something. No. We test him. How? Okay? By living in the truth. By living in the truth. In the truth. I didn't say by living the truth. I said by living in the truth of the gospel. Now, what does that look like? This is what it means. I live as one who is free. You understand that? I live as one who is free. I've been set free. I've been set free first from the penalty of sin. There is no more penalty for sin for me. I should be living in the freedom of that. Now, doesn't that take a load off you? We should be living, I mean, you know, when, when Israel came out and they wandered for those 38 years in the wilderness and they came into the land and they celebrated Passover because they hadn't celebrated in a long time and they came to Gilgal and Gilgal is where they took the stones out of the river and they put the, those stones on the land and they took the stones from the land and they put them under the river and Gilgal means the place where the reproach has been rolled away. 
Brothers and sisters, are you living like the reproach has been rolled away? Now, how many of you guys have read Christian, uh, or Pilgrim's Progress? The old English version. No, I want to see a hand. Oh, look at how few. Do you remember, those of you guys who have read it, do you remember when Christian comes to see the cross? Before he comes to see the cross, what does he, what does he have? He has this huge burden on his back. How do I get rid of this burden? Remember, he tries to go up the hill of legality and it, nothing happens. Then he finally gets to the place where he sees the cross. And what happens? The burden falls off of him. He doesn't throw the burden off him. The burden falls off of him. Brothers and sisters, the burden has fallen off of us. Why do we pick it up? It's not ours to take anymore. It's been taken from us. We're to live in that freedom. We should be rejoicing. But it's not like, you know, that old Greek thing, the sword of Damocles, where the sword was hanging by the hair, and the guy was eating, and he couldn't enjoy it because if he made too much noise, the hair would break. Some of us as Christians, we live like that. Like God's out, and he's just waiting to hammer us. Brothers and sisters, Christ died for our sins. We're free from that load. We do not have to carry anymore. I should be at peace with God. I should be at rest with what he's done for me. I shouldn't be looking for something else. Oh, what else can do it? This doesn't seem to be enough. I keep falling. I should be at rest with what he's done. That's enough. As far as my sin is concerned, there's nothing else that can be done. It's taken away. And as Christians... We should be believing that, and our life should show it. Like the, the, the hymn, It is well with my soul. If you look at that second verse, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. Now his thought, this is his thought. He says, it's in my, this thought is in my mind. It's, I'm captured by this very thought. It's, I'm meditating on the truth of it. And he says, my sin, all oh, the bless of this glory is not my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. How many of us cannot, when we come to that part, when we're singing that song, how many of us can't help but stand up. How many of us can't help but lift our hands because of the truth of this? And we should be living in the truth of this and living as if it is true because it is true. Get rid of that weight. Praise the Lord. This is our joy, that our sins are taken away, judged, that we bear them no more. This is our joy. Our circumstances aren't our joy. They change. Our possessions aren't our joy. They fade. They get old. They get stolen. Our accomplishments are not our joy because they fade and rust. But this gospel of Jesus Christ, this is our joy. And the gospel is first that our sins are forgiven. First. Our sins are forgiven because that allows us to enter in the rest of the gospel. And it's not only that we're forgiven and that we're justified, as glorious as that is, that we're reconciled to God. <clears throat> but it's more that being free from that penalty, I come to find <clears throat> that there's more of the gospel to experience. I mean, that's Romans 3, 4, and 5. Well, what about Romans 6, 7, and 8? Where we find out that I'm dead to sin. That not only has the penalty of sin been taken care of and put out of the way, but the power of sin has been defeated. Not weakened, defeated. That's what Romans 6 is about, right? I'm dead. I'm dead to that power. Now, brothers and sisters, we all 
go through Romans 7. Paul did. He wrote about it. That's the beauty of it. That even someone like Paul went through that time of saying, I, I'm not worthy. How can I? I want to do good, but I don't do good. But we come out to find in Romans 8 that God does not leave us as orphans. And an orphan is just someone who is not provided for and cared for. He's just left on his own. But after he forgives us, after he takes away our sins, he gives us a new life. And brothers and sisters, that's a testimony of the world. We find out, first of all, ourselves. We find out ourselves that we're new creatures. We are a new creation made after Christ. A creation where sin no longer has power over us as long as we walk in the newness of that life. And when people see that, that's a testimony to them. How can you do that? It's a testimony to brothers and sisters. I know you. How? It's Christ in me. It's Christ in me. And our lives are to testify of that life, of that life of Christ in us. It's not an obeying of rules. It's a life in us. It's a life that is seeking to live, moving in our own hearts, and our spirits, and our minds, saying, live. I want to live. In, in me is the power to overcome this. So, have I come to seeing that thing? Have I come to seeing that God has not left me an orphan? And that he's provided everything that I need. Am I finding this though? Am I beginning to experience these things? So, that's one thing. Now secondly, the manifestation of this life. Now we declare the life. We declare these facts. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, and Jeffrey hit on this in, in his ministry, sometimes, brothers and sisters, when we're, we're not making it, it's time for us to declare in prayer, to come before the Lord and declare, Lord, I'm yours. I see different things happening, but you know I'm yours. And I need to declare it. I need to declare to you I'm yours. And I need to declare, declare to me that I'm yours. Doesn't it say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so? I'm yours. And like the movie of Martin Luther when his spiritual father came to him and, he's, and, and Luther was going, I'm such a crummy guy. His spiritual father said to him, well, you go to God and you tell him, God, I'm yours. Save me. It's a wonderful testimony. I'm yours. You save me. Because you're saying I can't save myself. Brothers, when you come to that place, it's just like blessed are the poor in spirit. You just realize I just can't do it. But that's when you come to that realization that you can't do things. You look to God. And you find that he's provided for you. It takes these things for us to look to God. But when we do, we find he's provided. Now, how do we manifest this gospel? How do we manifest Christ? Jesus said to his disciples that you are the light of the world. So now we can say, well, I'm to be light. No, it's not that I'm to be light. Because if, if I'm to be light, then I'm going to look at how do I be light? He doesn't say, you are to be the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. It's a big difference, isn't it? You are the light of the world. How can I be the light of the world? Because Christ, who is the light of the world, is in you. That's how you're the light of the world. Now, the problem is, you know, how does this get manifested? Now, this light is not a reflected light. Okay, it's not that we are reflecting the light of, of God. You know, it's not like, remember Moses, I think it's in Exodus, um, I want to say 34. Um, 
that Moses went and he'd meet with the Lord and then he'd come out and his face would shine. But then remember, he put a curtain over his face. Why did he do that? Because the glory was fading. Reflected light fades. And, and, and brothers and sisters, a lot of us, that's what we are. We, 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 we do the reflected light thing. Because what we do is we try to get enough strength. By, we, we get into a place and we meet the Lord and then we run off that little blessing for a while and we try to do things. And it, because we're trying to do that, these things in our own flesh, the glory just fades. It can't stay on the flesh. But it's a transfiguring light. You know, it's like when the Lord Jesus was transfigured on, uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, it came out of him. It was within him. It came out. And the same with us. It's the Lord Jesus' life is in us who shines forth out of us. Yes, light has shined into us, but it shines out of us because Christ is in us. Now, this message that, that we're light, okay, is said to disciples. Now, what are disciples? Now, we can have two definitions of disciples. One is disciples are learners, okay? And the other is disciples are, disciples are followers. And I don't want to use the idea of disciples as learners because I think that we, we are in a generation of Christianity and also of, um, of, of people that uh, we, we like to learn. But that's all we do. We just like to learn. We just learn and learn and learn and learn and learn. And we learn so much we don't know what to do with it, so we invent games like Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> because what we're learning is trivial. You know, and we, we learn all these things because we're just full of knowledge. And then, and then and it's, it's like my, my students, now I, I, you know I teach gifted students. And my students, uh, they know a lot because they, they read a lot and stuff like that. But because they know a lot, because they think they've learned a lot, um, they don't think, you know, there's too much more to learn. Or they think that the way you learn is you uh, read a book or you go to lecture. You know, they don't go beyond that, you know. I, I, like, I was just grading a quiz. And uh, one of the questions I asked was, uh, what is an absolute ruler? What's an absolute ruler? And uh, darned if like 20 kids haven't put the thing that I said in class that isn't the definition. But they put it because I said it. And they learned that from me. You know what I mean? In other words, they didn't really look through it. They didn't even think about the question. They said, oh, he said this. Boom. OK. So I want to stay away from the disciples being learned. Now, they are learning. But they're learning not just book knowledge. They're learning a life. OK. And so I want to look at disciples as being followers. Um, they follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. Now, we don't have the physical Lord Jesus to lead us around like the 12 disciples did. But we do have the life of the Lord Jesus in us to lead us. The Lamb they follow, the Lamb that we are to follow, is the life of Christ in us. And we are to look to that life and, and what that means is uh, it, it's, not, it's not that we allow, okay? It's not that we allow the life of Christ to live in us. Because this idea of allow is so passive. We're not passive. Disciples aren't passive followers, you know? If you're going to follow someone, you have to get up and follow them. Right? You got to do that. We, you know, we, we, we follow like, oh, I follow his blog. You know what I mean? I follow his teaching because I read his books. 
You know, I follow his technique in speaking because I've read his book and he's a good speaker. I follow his technique in praying because, you know, he's a good prayer. But we're not to follow a teaching. We're to follow the Lamb. And, uh, and what that means is that we don't allow, but we must, in order to follow, we must bow the knee. We have to bow to that life. We have to give in to the life. And follow his lead. You've got to follow his lead. And um, <clears throat> when you follow that lead, the life of Christ will lead, lead us down two avenues. Okay? And these two paths will bring out that light that is in us. And, these, and, and the first path that he leads us on is he leads us on the, on the path to the cross. And I'm not talking about the cross of Calvary. We've already passed that. The burden's already fallen off. And so there's no question when we come in about, you know, our sins keeping us out. Because as we follow this path of the cross, we're going to find out there's a lot more in us that was dealt with back of the cross, but we're just realizing it now. But he leads us to the cross. And that just means this. It's the death to self. It's the death to our self. It's the death to us ruling our own lives. We are no longer in control. We have another king in our life. And the cross, in, in, in a sense, to us, in one way, is a refiner's fire. And what it does is it brings us up to the place where we have to come and say, and we come into situations every time where it's my way or his way. And what we find out is, we find out what our, what our way really looks like. It's dross. It can't be melted into what God is making. It doesn't melt. It has to be, once it's melted and the gold is being melted, the dross you've got to take out. So when that refiner's going, he's stirring the, the pot, looking for it, and the dross starts coming up, and then we, we're exposed. It's exposed to us. He says, this is it. This is what I'm dealing with. This must be gone. And now it's up to us to say, no, I, I will not give it up. Or yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm bowing the knee. I'm giving in to him. And then he takes the dross out. And this happens, you know, every time the fire gets a little hotter next time. Every time. And he has the tools to do this. We don't go looking for the cross. We're led to it. And the instruments of the cross, the instruments of death to self, are familiar. There are other saints. There are family. There are jobs. And there are very habits. All of these things we come into contact with, all these things are ways that the Lord says, this is how I put to death you. Because these are the ways that we are these things are made known to us. And then we have to come to the place of saying, it's odious to me. We have to come to a place of saying, you are better than this thing. You are better than this habit. You are better than this characteristic. I no longer want this. Take it away. And some, I know we've heard a lot of times we're not willing to do it. We say, I want to be made willing. Well, when you pray that prayer, he'll bring you about to be making willing so the thing gets out. But remember, you have to be willing. You have to bow the knee. It's the cross. And so that's one avenue we go down the cross. And our job is only this, in being led, is to open our hands to when he, he want, says, this is the cross. This is, where, this is where I nail, this is where you're nailed to the cross. And it's for us, is to open our hands. Like he said to Peter, someone, someone will take you in time to, to a place you don't want to go. And brothers and sisters, none of us want to go to the cross. 
There's not a single person in here that wants to go. Do we, need, do we know that we need to go? Yes. But do we want to go? No. It's not like Black Friday. and Everybody's saying, yeah, I want to get to the store and get this. Oh, yeah, I want the cross. No. You know, we, we pray like the Lord prayed. If this can pass for me. And you know, uh, for a long time, our prayer is this. If this can pass for me, we don't say the other part. We just say, if this can pass for me, just let this pass. And the Lord does. He'll just bring you, and then he'll bring you around circle again to the same place. Oh, just let this pass. Just this one time, let it pass. They'll finally get to the place where he's hoping and willing for us to be, that we say, but not my love. My will, but yours be done. You know, we have to have our Gethsemanes. And he'll bring us around to that garden. It's a garden. You know, I don't know if you ever, ever think about that as the place where Christ had it out here. It was a garden. You know, how unassuming. And you know, the cross, to the, before you get to the cross, sometimes it is. You know, you're going there and you just have to give up and but you know when the Lord is asking you to go to the cross there's a fragrance there there's a fragrance there to, to draw you on to going I was saying I have this for you now a lot of you guys that are younger you go well gee whiz I don't, I don't want to have to deal with these things until I'm older anyway I've got life to live I want to sow my wild oats or whatever and I know because I was that way too. But you know, we don't know what tomorrow brings. You don't know. So it's better to just say, Lord, I, I, I don't want to do these things. But by faith, I'm going to say that what you have is better. And I'm going to believe you. And I'm going to trust you by going into this death. And I'm counting on you to bring me out of this. Into another, into a higher part of life. Where I can see how much better it is. Because I've given myself to you. Now, the second road we go to is the road of service. And... Um, it's uh, his life leading us because his life is saying in us, I must be about my father's business. <clears throat> I've come to do your will, oh God. That's what his life in us says. And again, we have to bow the knee to it because it's his service. It's not the service that I want. It's his service. It's service unto him because it's service that he is asking you to do. You know, it's what he chooses. He's choosing your, your place of service. And you know something? I'm going to tell you this. The place he chooses you to serve is always beyond your strength and capacity to serve. I'm sorry to tell you that. Because he wants to manifest his power in you. Because when he calls you to do something, he knows you can't do it. But he knows if you're faithfully going out and said, Lord, I don't, I don't have the wherewithal. But I'm going because you've told me to go. You know, John Eklund, uh, who was here from the Bay Area, he went down to, to a little place in Mexico, Mascota, where uh, the people in the uh, Bay Area go and the people in San Diego go every once in a while to strengthen the, uh, there's a little group of saints down there. And I was asking him about it, I go, you know, well, and he went down there, he goes, you know, it's a scary thing to go down, uh, even when you know it's the will of the Lord. It's a little more comforting to know it's the will of the Lord that you go, but it's still scary. Because as you're going down there, you go, Lord, what am I going to do? I don't, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't know what you can do with me. He said, it's always wonderful to find out when you get out there, you find yourself stepping out and you find the Lord just filling you for that service. 
enabling you to bless, to be a blesser, whether it be through disciplining, whether it be through uh, exhorting, whether it be through praying, whether it may, maybe it is to heal somebody. Maybe it's to preach a sermon. Maybe it's just there to comfort somebody. But it's the Lord strengthening you to do that. You know, um, I, I think uh, sometimes you feel that people that come up here are really confident. Um, we're not. And if we are confident in ourselves, it's, it's a bomb. And no one knows it more than us unless we're fooling ourselves. But I'll tell you, there's a couple of times where, you know, it's something the Lord's doing. I remember one time, there, the first uh, conference, the little youth retreat, Alhambra is having a youth retreat, and they had asked Floyd Police to speak at it. And he was supposed to speak three times. And it was, the, the retreat, I think, started like on a, on a Wednesday or something like that. And Floyd called me up on Sunday night. I, was, I think it started on Tuesday. And Floyd called me up on Sunday night. He goes, uh, Jim, you know, I'm not feeling really good, and I just want to know, like, if I just can't make it up there, will you go in my place? It's like two days away, right? And what do you say to Floyd? No, Floyd, find somebody else. It's like saying to the Lord, Lord, find somebody else. Isn't that what Moses said? Find somebody else. And I... I for some reason, I said, yeah, Floyd, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So he calls up Monday. I can't make it. You, you have to have three messages. What do you do? You know how long it prepares sometimes for people like, like me to make a message? Ask my wife. Ask my wife what time I go to bed on, on Saturday night. You know, um, so I went there, and I had just a few thoughts. And I remember going driving down. It was like driving to my death. You know, oh my gosh! I, I remember one time uh, there was a guy who was driving with me. I was supposed to speak on a Sunday, and and, and it was John Eklund. He goes, he looked at me. He goes, Jim, you look like you're going to be executed. <laughs> and you know, yeah, because you die. And so I remember I had a few thoughts, and I was driving, and I was just going, oh, what have I done? But then I started going to the Lord. I said, Lord, here I am. I don't know what, what else to tell you. Here I am. And, uh, and all I can say is the Lord did a wonderful thing. He gave me a wonderful word. I think it was one of the best things I ever did. But it's just because it was his service. It was his call. It was his looking for someone who would just say, I'll go. Right? That's it. There are, there are stories I could tell you about that, about ministering, but you know, I don't want to bore you with it. Anyway, it's late. But anyway, we're called into service. And the service is uh, uh, generally, it's not things that we would uh, necessarily choose. Um, but we choose them because God is burdening our hearts to do them. Maybe to go out to a brother or a sister. Maybe to take someone out to the You know, it could be just that one-on-one -on -one ministry. It could be ministry like this. It could be ministry to go out and preach the gospel. I don't know. It could be any type of ministry. But it is always according to the new heart he's given us. He's given us a heart that wants to do as well. Now, there is work that we choose to do ourselves, and we will find out really quickly that it's not his service. Because we have no joy in it, we have no peace in it, and we have a waning desire to continue doing it. And we get no filling from doing it. We get, we get finished with that ministry and we say, I'm glad that's over. But the ministry he gives us, the ministry he gives us, we might come back and say, boy, I, I stunk it up today. And a lot of times we do, we go home, we go, oh, gee, I'm just such a failure. And the Lord just fills you up and sends you home and goes, okay, here's another place to go. He wants you to be faithful in your service. He's calling you to do it, be faithful. Yeah, be prepared and be faithful. 
And service leads you back to the cross. But this time it's not a cross of refining. It's the cross of laying down your life for the brethren. And laying down your life for the unsaved. It's a different type of cross. But it's the same thing in the sense that it's you're dying to yourself so that Christ can come through and minister to others. Service is obeying his call, his leading, and finding his provision in that service. And service is an offering of love. It's not something I begrudge. It's an offering of love. Here is my time. Here are my hands. Here are my feet. Here's my mind. They're yours. Do with them as you want. I want to serve you. So to be light, really then, is to testify that Jesus is Lord. And brothers and sisters, this is what God wants. He wants this testimony that my son saves and that my son is Lord. This is the two things that God wants in his, of his people. A testimony that he saves others and a testimony that he's Lord in us first before he's Lord of everyone else. Everyone at one time will bow the knee. But now is our time to bow the knee. This is what God is asking of us. This is what he's waiting for. Why is he delaying? Because we haven't bowed the knee. We're not bowing the knee to him so that he can have a testimony of his son through us. And he's provided everything that there might be a testimony through it. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It's not like he's knuckling us under and stuff like this and he's shaming us. He's just saying, look what I've given. Look what I have for you. If you'll just bow, it's yours. If you'll bow the knee, you'll find that it's yours. This is his, I don't want to say it's his plea. This is his offer to us. When he offers us his son as being savior, and we accept that, the whole rest comes with it. The whole rest is there. I think so often we just get enamored with the turkey on the table, and we forget there's other stuff there. And it's all meant for us, and it's all meant to strengthen us so that we can go about and do his business. You know, a lot of us, you know, we're going to go through, oh, I, I fall so short. Yeah, we do. Well, what are you to do about it? Well, I'll tell you what you do about it. You tell the Lord that you fall short. You confess it. Just go right to him and say, God, I've fallen short. And I find I just can't help myself from falling short in just that way. So we confess it, and then we, then we repent. And repent means more than just we turn or change our mind. Repent means we fall before the Lord. And we just say, I want you to be Lord. Repenting is saying, I don't want to be king anymore. I want you to be king. And then uh, we go and do. We rejoice too. We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice that, he's, that this is our calling. That, he, that God is wanting and willing to entrust this calling to us who have Christ in us. This is a marvelous thing. We should be rejoicing, and we should be embracing. Let us embrace this calling and say, Lord, yes, this is, this is what I was meant for. I was meant for this. I want this. I want to embrace it. Even though it costs me, I want to embrace this. Let us be willing in this way. Let us go in that way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you I want to thank you for so great a calling you've called to us to. to. I want to thank you you provided everything. We, we, 
we want to stop, Lord, we want to stop short. We just want to say like Moses, I can't do it, send someone else. But Lord, you want to show us that you are our salvation. That it's you who is able to do all these things. You are our savior. You are our sanctifier. Oh Lord, we want our eyes open to these things. We come to tell you this morning, Lord, that we, we're yours. Save us and bring us into this ministry of testimony to you, to your glory forever. Amen.